Tonight's lesson and next week's lesson, I think, may be the most important lessons when you're trying to convince a skeptic, because I think the information we're going to share tonight and next week will we'll have more on there of anything we've looked at so far to try to disprove evolutionary theory. And you'll see what I mean when we get through with tonight's lesson. I think you'll see what we mean, especially when we get through with next week's lesson. And of course, you're reading these lessons ahead of time, so you know what I'm talking about. But these next two lessons, I think, are, uh, I mean, you have to basically throw away any semblance of logic to hold on to evolutionary theory. But remember in our first class, one of our very first classes, the reason I spent so much time talking about why scientists hold to evolution is because of what we're going to talk about tonight and tomorrow night uh, and next week. Because how can they hold on to evolution after we're going to present these facts? And it's because they don't have anything else. I mean, we've talked about that. It, it's simply because they can't see another point of view. It has to be naturalistic, and evolution is the only naturalistic theory that's out there right now. So even when you present them with the kind of facts, and they know these facts that we're going to talk about t uh, tonight and, and next week, they know these things, uh, but they just still don't believe them because they don't have any other, they ha have no other the recourse. But if you're going to refer uh, someone to our uh, lessons on YouTube, and they want to, if you have someone who's on the fence post especially, if they've already made their mind up, it probably won't make any difference. But if they really want to see some hard facts uh, on how unlikely evolution is, this lesson and the next lesson would be the ones to really look at. Which also brings up the point, I ha haven't said this enough, but if you have any questions, and whether you're in this class or you're, or you're, or you're seeing this on YouTube, um, address them to Bo Kirkwood at AOL.com and I'll do what I can to get back with you or at least discuss those questions at the next lesson because this is where some questions may start popping up even more so than what we've seen in the past. So last week we looked at the DNA molecule. We're not going to belabor that again but I'm going to quickly go over the importance of the DNA molecule because it's going to be important to understand for tonight. And remember that amino acids are constructed by information that, that, that is present in the DNA molecule. DNA unwinds the RNA molecule, and RNA, I, I didn't really do a good job explaining the difference between RNA and DNA, but RNA is a single-stranded molecule, so it doesn't have to unwind. But it has the same base pairs, except it has uracil for one of its base, base pairs. And uh, when proteins are made, it's, proteins are made by combinations of amino acids. And the way amino acids are sequenced will determine which protein is being made. And there are, I don't know how many proteins there are in the human body, but trust me, there's many, many proteins in the human body. You know, there's a lot of proteins in the human body. So there has to be a lot of different information coming from the DNA molecule to make each one of those proteins. Because those pr proteins, once again, are made up of amino acids, which are coded by the three, uh, the combination of, of, of the three base, three, three base pairs, which is called a codon. And then the order of those amino acids determines the protein. So you remember all that from last week. Then the ribosome breaks away from the chromosome, goes through the cell, goes, goes through the, the nucleus into the, 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 uh, the cell itself, attaches to ribosomes where proteins are made. And every protein has to have the exact same sequence. And those, uh, most proteins, the average protein is about 150 amino acids. That's the average. Some are smaller, some are bigger. That's a lot of sequencing that has to be perfect for a protein to be made, and there are many, many proteins. So, some have tried to determine mathematically how the complex molecule of, uh, of uh, amino, not amino acid, but DNA could occur naturally, and then some have looked at how proteins could have occurred naturally, how, how you could have gotten just simple proteins together uh, naturally, and they've, they've done this mathematically. And like I said last week, by all accounts, the likelihood is very, very small. And we'll see how unlikely it is tonight. And so in order to do that, you're going to have to prove basically three things. And this comes from Stephen Meyer's book, uh, Darwin's Doubt. Uh, maybe Signature of the Cell. I forget which one it is now. They run together for me a little bit. But this is from Stephen Meyer. So first, you're going to have to determine where is the origin of the system for storing and coding information in the cell's DNA storage capacity. That's the first thing you're going to have to show, mathematically or uh, naturalistically. Where's that origin? 
Secondly, explain the origin of large amounts of specific complexity or functionally specified information in the DNA. Where did it come from? That was the big question that we had last week, wasn't it? Okay, you've got information in DNA. Where did that DNA come from? Where that, specifically, where did that information or that order of those sequences come from? There's no good explanation for it, but if you're gonna do it from a naturalistic standpoint, there's a good explanation from a non-naturalistic standpoint, but if you're gonna hold to a naturalistic theory, tell me where the origin was, where this started. And then thirdly, you gotta to have to explain the origin of integrated complexity in the cell's information processing system. We're gonna look at that a little bit more next week. But there's, if you think of a computer and you think of circuitry, and there's a lot of information going on besides just what you have in the DNA molecule itself. And there's a lot of information being shared within the cell itself and for, for protein synthesis to occur. And that information has to, be, has to be transferred. And kind of think of a circuit board, if you will, a computer circuit board. You're gonna to have to come up with the origin of that. So you don't have to come up with just the origin of DNA. You have to come up with the origin of, of a lot of other things. And if you're naturalistic, you've, you've, got, th you've got three choices, or maybe a com uh, two choices, or a combination of two. First, it either has to have occurred by chance, okay? Just random chance would have had to have occurred for, for these sequencings to occur. That's one way. The other would be law-like forces, meaning they had to occur because it's a law. It'd be kind of like the law of gravity or the law of electromagnetism, one of these kind of laws that would have forced the DNA molecule to occur. Or you're going to have to have some combination of that. And so there are mathematicians, there are, there are, there are uh, scientists, physicists, and, and biologists, and, and a lot of other people that have tried to put mathematically what the likelihood of these molecules, DNA, and proteins occurring naturally would be. And we're gonna look briefly at that, but some people that are a whole lot smarter than I am have already decided that it just couldn't happen. And I mentioned two of them here, and we're gonna be looking at others uh, uh, as well. But on my left is the Nobel Prize winner, Eugene Wigner. Wigner was uh, with Sir Fred Hoyle, was responsible for coming up with a static state theory of the universe. He also did a lot of work with relativity, Einstein's theory on relativity. And he said overwhelmingly, the odds are against undirected chemical evolution. Just overwhelmingly, he said that. And this is, this is Nobel Prize winner. And then you had Sir Herman Bondi, a mathematician and, and professor, and he also just had to reject chemical evolution. He said chemical evolution just could not have occurred naturally. And so you've got some, again, some pretty smart people. So chance has been, you know, that's the number one reason. Because when you look at laws, there's no natural laws that require DNA to come together. There just aren't. Well, we'll talk about that briefly later on tonight. But there just isn't any natural law. So you're going to have to rely on chance at this point. But chance doesn't really cause anything, does it? And when you start looking at chance as your only explanation, you're really looking at an argument of ignorance, in my opinion. You've just, you're giving, a, you're giving up, you're just saying, well, that's the way it had to be and the only way it could occur is by chance. And to me, that is an argument of ignorance. Nonetheless, we're gonna look at that argument and what, what are the likelihood of chance uh, explaining the origin of life. This is uh, from 19, 1920s. Ronald Fisher was a statistician and he came up, uh, came up mathematically what we really know intuitively already. But he looked at what, look, what was the, the likelihood of something occurring by chance. And when, a, when the likelihood of something occurring by chance becomes so unlikely, you should throw chance out. You should just get rid of it. He called it his rejection zone. And it's, you know, it's, it's a graph when, when you look at it, the, a graph that you're kind of similar with, a, a slope. And he put it in words, and I'm going to read this. Uh, and this, this is again from uh, Ronald Fisher. He said that the chance hypothesis can be eliminated precisely when a series of events that deviate too greatly from the expected statistical distribution of events based on what we know about the process that generate these events or what we know from sampling how frequently the events will occur. That's a whole lot of language, but basically it says when the chance just gets so ridiculously small, you throw it away, unless it's really not chance at all. In that case, it's, it, it, it's, a, it's a law. It's an absolute law. 
And so we know this intuitively. What do I mean by that? Well, if you went to some place, uh, hopefully nobody in here would do that, but, but if somebody went to uh, uh, Las Vegas or, or someplace else uh, to gamble on the roulette wheel, and he sat down and he or she bet on red 16 a hundred times, first of all, the odds of landing on red 16, I believe, is on a roulette wheel is 1 in 35. That may be a little bit greater than that, 1 in 36, 37, I don't know. But, it, but it's about that. And so th that's not highly unlikely that you're going to bet on red 16 and win, win one time. You know, you got a, you got a reasonably good odds. But if you did that a hundred times in a row, you bet on the same number, red 16, 100 times in a row, and you won every time, what do you think they'd be doing to you at that casino? They would say the game's rigged. There's a, there's, there's a magnet on red 16 and there's a metal on that ball that goes around or something, but you would know intuitively that land, landing, on red, landing on red 16 100 times in a row just doesn't happen by chance. You understand that? But do you understand that the, the chance of rolling that thing 100 times and landing on any numbers, whatever numbers you come up with 100 times in a row, is the same chance as rolling red 16 100 times in a row. Whatever sequence you come up with, that's not the issue. But it'd be very unusual because of why. We're going to talk about that in just a second. So William Dembski, who is with the intelligent design community, brilliant mathematician, that's what his degree's in, PhD, smart guy, he brings it out even further. He said, look at a sequence of 6,000 events, because the chance of DNA is a lot more than 100 events occurring in a row. It's going to have to be a whole lot more than that, a whole lot more than that. So the odds of a sequence of 6,000 characters is roughly the same for any other sequence of 6,000 characters, but getting a pattern for that order is an entirely different thing. And that's the difference. Red 16, 100 times in a row, I'm now designating a pattern. You see, I'm saying I'm gonna roll this 16 in a row. And that's different than just rolling it 100 times and getting whatever number you get 100 times because the odds are the same. But if I said I'm gonna, I get that same thing, but instead of red 16, I'm gonna, it's kinda like what's going on right now in the basketball world. You know, there's this billion dollar prize that's, that's been offered for picking, I think, the, the, the winner of every one of the games in the, in, the, in, in the NCAA tournament. You know what the odds of that are? They're extremely high. I, don't, I haven't, does anybody know? I mean, it's like, it's, it's, the chances of someone doing that are real small. Well, 6,000 characters would be even smaller. And that's what we're talking about. But it's, it's, it's identifying that pattern because somebody's going to win those games. Somebody's going to do it. But the chances of you picking that pattern are real small. And that's the whole thing. For example, let's say we put in our computer and we just had somebody start randomly <laughs> typing blindfolded. Or, you know, the, the analogy is the monkey uh, uh, typing something blindfolded. And let's say uh, they typed out four score and seven years ago. Okay, that was one pattern. And then the other one is when they came up with this uh, Nini, Ta, Jill, Jim, that's not a, anything, that's gibberish. You understand that that's gibberish. But do you understand that the likelihood of typing any one of those two things in a row is the same? It's the same likelihood, but the difference is one of them has meaning and one of them has no meaning at all. And so when you apply pattern to something, it becomes much more significant and unlikely. Both of these contain information, if you will, and Dembski refers to Shannon information. Shannon was a mathematician uh, you know, you know, 60, 70 years ago as well. But Shannon's information is not meaningful information. When you add a pattern to it, it's very important. So is it important? It's extremely important that, that you're identifying a pattern. So even if you got to the point where you had uh, proteins and or, or nucleotides together in the DNA molecule, you're still, in order to build these molecules, they're going to have to come together some way, but they're going to have to come together in a very specific way to produce meaningful proteins. So understand what we're talking about. Okay, let's look, the, let's look at another analogy just to get what, how the unlikelihood is. You would think tossing a coin 100 times, that's, that's easier than roulette wheel, because a roulette wheel, you got 35 choices. When you toss a, toss a coin, you got 50-50 chance of head or tails, right? 
but tossing a coin a hundred times in a row and it landing in a specific pattern, and we'll just say it's going to be heads every time. We'll use that as our specific pattern. Your chances are one in whatever that number is, and I cannot actually identify that number. I don't know what it is, but I guess it's a trillion at least. Uh, 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 it, it's more than a trillion. But point is, it would take you in order to get that number, if you sit there and flip that coin repeatedly over and over and over, the odds of you're doing it are fin infinitesimally small and would it take you a, probably at least a trillion years just to flip them enough times to get to that pattern. Now that's small. Now I had, I had a slide on here about, uh, Cherry's gonna try to get to it, that we're gonna be looking at big numbers tonight huge numbers and some of these numbers are really hard for us to even fathom you know you can grasp a thousand you can grasp a hundred thousand you can grasp a million uh, you can grasp a billion you start getting into a trillion it gets a little bit more difficult and so when you start adding these powers it gets uh, quite a bit more difficult but just to kind of give you an idea because we're going to be looking at 10 to the 33rd and 10 to the 64th and in one case we're going to be looking at 10 to the 40,000th power and to just kind of give you how these uh, uh, how these are, are, are small this goes to what is 10 to the second power? 100? 10 to the third power? 1,000? 10 to the fourth power? So that gives, you, that gives you the numbers. 10 to the, th 10 to the third power is 1,000. 10 to the fourth power is 10,000. Fifth power is 100,000. 10 to the sixth power is a million. Ninth power is a billion. A trillion is 12. 10 to the twelfth power is a, tw uh, is, is a trillion. That's, what's our deficit right now? It's in the trillions, I, I know that. That's a lot of money. But we're gonna be looking at numbers that go way beyond that. Scroll on down to maybe the last one. And, uh, 10 to the, uh, go to the 10 to the 31st power if you can. Okay, you got one 10 to the 30th power. And they call that a, a, non, a nanillion, a nanillion. Okay, I, those are numbers we, bottom line is, you can go ahead and go to the next slide. The, the bottom line is those are numbers we don't deal with day in and day out. We will never deal with these kind of numbers because they're so, so high. I mean, the number of atoms in, the, in, in our galaxy is something like, I think, 10 to the 69th power. We have a slide that alludes to that. Those are big numbers. Now, William Dembski makes a <coughs> profound statement. And he says, although even if you had 1 to the 64th power as the unlikelihood of something occurring, I guess it's reasonable to say there's a chance. <laughs> okay. It's an un, 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 not a lo logical chance, but, it, but it's a chance. So he says, scientists can never absolutely prove that some astronomically improbable event could not have taken place by chance, but they can determine when it is more likely than not that such an event wouldn't or didn't happen by chance alone. I think that's a very gross understatement at the very least. And so Dembski, when you look at his book, uh, the, uh, the Design Inference, came up with something he referred to as the universal probability bound. And that's the probability using what he called an explanatory filter. That is the probability of life occurring by chance. And how did he come up with the number? First, using the total elementary particles in the universe at 10 to the 80th power. That's what scientists have estimated. That's the number of all the particles in the entire universe times the possible interactions per second these particles could have, which is 10 to the 44th, 45th power, and then this number by the number of events that could have taken place in the universe since its origins at five billion years, which is what scientists say, which is 10 to the 25th, and you get a universal, universal probability bound of 10, and he puts a negative number on it, but negative 150 power. That's a huge number. You understand that that's a number that means it's impossible, basically. And he's done this mathematically. Fred Hoyle, in 1983, did something different, but he looked at it a little bit different. He didn't look at just, I guess you could say kind of similar, but he placed the odds of a single one-celled organism occurring by chance at 10 to the 40,000th power. And this is a kind of a well-quoted uh, study. 
That was in 1983, but before that you had some scientists that came together. They were called the Y Star Institute, and some of these people were from Massachusetts Institute of Technology and some very prestigious universities, not, not uh, some creationists that got together to decide we were going to prove that, that uh, uh, life could not occur by chance. These were mathematicians and, and biologists that came together in 1966, sort of kind of a, free, uh, a think tank, if you will, to look at the chance that life could occur. And what they were looking at was the mathematical probability of a sharp protein of 150 amino acids, which is what we said the average length of a protein was, about 150 amino acids, coming together by chance was 10 to the 195th power. I mean, again, these are just so, these numbers are so astronomical, it's hard for us to fathom that. But this is much more than one in a trillion. If a trillion, what did we say a trillion was? One to the 12th power? Is that what I said? Okay, you're talking about one to the 195th power. These are huge numbers. And again, these are not creationists. Now, Robert Saver, who was, uh, he was part of that uh, uh, Y Star Institute, or they, that's what they called themselves, but he's from MIT. And he looked at the probability of achieving a functional sequence of amino acids. So it's one thing to come up with a run of, a, of 150 amino acids to get a protein, but now he's kind of come up with the functionality of them. Are they going to be functional or not? And he said the chance of that is one to, the six, uh, one to 10 in the 63rd power. And I know these numbers vary. The point is they're all huge. That's the biggest thing I'm trying to say here. And he said, that uh, there's only 10 to the 69th power atoms in our galaxy. And we said 10 to the 80th power of elements in the entire universe. And these are not creationist numbers. These are what most scientists believe. And that assumes that, that we, we think we know every single one that exists and that we're not going to know anymore, right? Correct. Correct. Exactly. That we know the size of the universe, which we don't know. Exactly. Yeah. So that would make the numbers even higher. You're exactly right. Good point made. And so others have postulated one, function, one functional protein coming forth spontaneously from some prebiotic soup could be no better than one in the 164th, 164th power. Uh, that should be, I guess, 10 to the 164th power. Now this is, this now you got the prebiotic soup. You got, you know, not amino acids, but you got certain elements in the soup, then you gotta heat them up. We're gonna talk about that in a week or two uh, because uh, Miller, the Miller's experiment that tried to prove that they were able to pre, uh, produce some sort of life in the, in the, um, in the laboratory turns out to, to not, not be true. But this assumes you've got a prebiotic soup to begin with and you get an astronomical number. And then one more, uh, using mutagenesis experiments, Douglas Axe out of Cambridge University, he said the odds of a functional protein occurring by chance was one in 10 to the uh, 77th power. Okay, so let's just summarize this. We got universal probability of 10 to the minus 150th power. We got uh, one cell organism 10 to the 40th thousand power. One short protein of 150 amino acids, one to 195th power. One functional amino acid, one to the 63rd power. Uh, one functional protein, one to 164th power. And mutation causing functional protein, one uh, to 10 to the 77th power. I think if you start looking at numbers like that and you're still going to rely on chance as the cause, you've just thrown away any semblance of logic. I mean, you've just thrown logic away. It is not logical. So you may think, I mean, um, the evolutionist may think they have the answers, but they don't have the answers to the origin of life, and they understand how difficult that is. And yet they still hold to it because they're naturalist. But they don't hold to it from anything that is of a logical uh, consequence. They just don't. It's illogical. It's about as illogical as it gets. One more time, William Dembski. I love this guy because, I mean, he's a he's logical thinker. And I don't believe everything William Dembski believes or Stephen Meyer or anybody else in, the, in, in uh, intelligent design, but they have a lot of good stuff to say. And so I like to, like to use what they say that I agree with and, and that makes a lot of sense to me. And he's put this as a postulate. Okay, so let's summarize everything we've just talked about in some sort of uh, postulate, and Dembski has done this for us. So first of all, premise one, life has occurred. Anybody deny that? I mean, you've got to be, have a really strange philosophical point of view if you're going to deny life, but I'm sure there's somebody out there that would deny that too. 
So premise one is life has occurred. So we're going to hold that, that that's true. Okay. Life is specified. Would anybody deny that? You take, we've already seen the information in DNA to produce proteins. It has to be very specific, doesn't it? So life is specified. Okay. So premise three. If life is due to chance, life has a small probability. Would anybody deny that after the numbers we just looked at? Evolutionists wouldn't even deny that. Stephen Gold, when he, was, was, when he was alive, would not even deny that. I don't know about our friend Richard Dawkins, but most evolutionists that think logically would agree with that premise. Premise four, specific events, a small probability, do not occur by chance. Does anybody disagree with that? Okay, they just don't occur by chance. And we've looked at those numbers, rolling uh, or flipping a coin a hundred times in a row and landing on heads just doesn't occur by chance, unless you throw logic out the window. Premise five, life is due to a regularity, and I threw this in there to just so you'll know what a regularity is. A regularity is a natural law, like gravity. It has to occur. You, you know, if I drop a pencil here, it's gonna hit the floor. That's a natural law. So life is not due to a regularity. We don't know of any natural law that said life had to start. You know, gravity, electromagnetic force, any force you look at in nature, and there's a lot of constants that are here, and they were put here by, I think, someone of intelligence, God, but life is not a regularity. So that leaves you that life is either due to a regularity or chance. We've eliminated regularity. We've eliminated chance. The conclusion is life has to be due to design. I, I have a hard time arguing with that, do you? And if you're thinking logically, I don't see how you would have a, what the argument b would be against what Dembski said. So some people said, okay, we'll grant you. DNA not likely to occur. So you know what they're looking at now? They're looking at the RNA molecule, the RNA world it's sometimes referred to. And you'll hear that. If you talk to uh, 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 students that are in, in college, they say, well, DNA didn't start at all. RNA did. Well, because they've got to come up with something. They know how ridiculous DNA is. RNA is not the answer. And I don't have enough time to go into great detail, but you sort of get into the same thing, even if you believe RNA was the answer. You're gonna to have to still come up with some sequencing. And the thing is, if RNA needs DNA to make a protein, how is it gonna make a protein by itself? It's implausible. It doesn't even make sense. It has to attach to that information that's in the DNA molecule to begin with. So this does not solve the problem of biologic information. It only displaces it. Uh, also, if you could make an RNA molecule, RNA molecule is a very hard molecule to make, just like DNA would be a very hard molecule to make, but it is very unstable in the atmosphere. It's, gonna, it's, not going, it's, not going to, it's not going to last very long at all, and it possesses very few specific enzymatic proteins. And finally, an RNA-best translation and coding system is just totally implausible. But they gotta latch on to something. What else do they come up with an explanation? Well, some have said DNA is a result of self-organization. So they realize chance won't get it done. Chance will not get it done. So it has to be self-regulating or it's biochemically predestined. Biochemical predestination. Seems like you're starting to give up on a naturalistic cause when you start going in to these things. The problem is you can't explain DNA that way. DNA cannot be explained by just invoking bonding attributes. Michael. Polanyi has shown that even if living organisms function like machines, they cannot be fully explained by reference to the laws of physics and chemistry. Chemistry does not explain how DNA got here. There's no reason from a chemical point of view why DNA would just show up. It's just not going to do it. So how can you still not believe? How then can scientists still hold to the molecules to the evolution theory? And most would defer to the anthropic principle. How many in here have heard the anthropic principle? Yeah, no, it, basically what the anthropic principle says is it occurred because it had to occur. And we're here, aren't we? Therefore it occurred. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? Okay, it's just saying it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how improbable it is. The fact that we're here says it still happened that way. So you could say it's one in a trillion, you could say it's one in a trillion trillion. You can say it's one in a trillion trillion trillion. Doesn't matter, we're here. It occurred. That's the way I look at the anthropic principle. That's probably not exactly what it means, but that's the way I look at it. It's a cop-out is what it is. They say, well, the anthropic principle explains it. 
the laws of nature, and the law, it doesn't tell you where those laws come from, but the laws of nature uh, are such, and the planets are lying such, and we're in the solar system uh, where we're at because of a certain reason, and because of all that, life came together because everything fit perfectly, and they'll defer that to the anthropic principle. Now, most evolutionists, that's what they do. I will give Charles uh, uh, Dawkins, or Richard Dawkins, at least, I started to say Charles Darwin did it last week, uh, Richard Dawkins, a little bit of credit, because he tried to come, with, come up with a naturalistic process. So what he did is he showed that he could get a computer to say, me thinks it's like a weasel. Now I'll give you extra credit if you know where me thinks it's like a weasel came from. I bet you someone in this room knows. Any clue? Well, I'll give you a hint. Richard, uh, uh, Shakespeare? It's from Hamlet. And the only reason I know that, I was watching uh, Hamlet, uh, the old uh, uh, Lawrence Olivier production that was done in the 40s, and I just happened to catch it when Hamlet say, me, when he says, me thinks it's like a weasel. So he, he got a computer to do that. He says randomly. But let's look at what he really did. And this comes from the blind watchmaker, by the way. Uh, this is where Richard Dawkins uh, came up with this. And he did an experiment. And this is what Dawkins did. He programmed the computer to generate many separate strings and then compared the strings to a Shakespearean target phrase and selected only the string that most closely resembled the target. The computer then generated variant versions, compared it to the target over and over and over again until the target phrase, me thinks it's like a weasel, was produced. And Richard Dawkins thought, man, there it is. See, it occurred all naturally. Does anybody have a problem with that? Right. There was a target to begin with, and he designed the target. Me thinks it's like a weasel. He, designed, he put that target in there, and then he designed the computer to do what it needed to do to get to that target. It didn't do anything naturally. It's a, to me, it's an absurd thing. You know, the blind watchmaker sold millions of copies, and so did his The, the God Delusion. And there's a lot of people out in the world buying his books by the millions. He's a very rich man. And this is what they look at. Do they not think when they look at that? Dawkins' own intelligence was programmed in the computer. It wasn't natural. And here's the problem. Now, there's been a lot of other computer programs that have been used to try to explain the origin of life. Not just that one. In fact, if you read uh, Colin's book, The Language, Language of God, he's got in there, he, he refers to a computer program that shows the tree of life. And we'll talk about that a little bit next week. And he says, see, it was all computer generated. But here's the problem. All computer aided models that attempt to explain naturalistic cause for the origin of life suffer from the same generic problem and that they're all programmed by an intelligent programmer. Just as Dan brought out, brought out. That's the problem. So don't buy into that. I read somebody's book and the computer was able to generate life all on its own. No, it didn't. It was computed in that. So Francis Crick understood that. We know Francis Crick, remember him? Guy that discovered DNA with James Watson. He said, that ain't gonna happen. DNA cannot possibly occur by itself. And so he said it was a miracle. He said, uh, people that have looked at origins of life have said, is that our first bell? Okay. Um, have said that uh, it's, when you look, and these are the evolutionists now. Uh, Klaus Dose, he's a German biochemist. When you've looked at origin of life experiments, it's led to a better perception of the intensity of the problem of the origin of life rather than its solution. So all these experiments that have tried to explain the origin of life have only made it worse. And it's because they're starting with the wrong premise, isn't it? Stephen Gold, I, I talked about Stephen Gold. Stephen Gold has now passed away, but he was one of the, the biggest evolutionists in, in the 1960s and early 70s and 80s even. And uh, he said that it was a glorious accident which required 60 trillion contingent events. Does that sound logical to you? <laughs> He's an evolutionist, or he was. So what was, Crick, what was Crick's explanation? If it, was, if it couldn't have been an accident from Francis Crick's point of view, what could have explained it? Well, I think you've heard this term, panspermia. I don't know if, I think that was Crick who came up with that term, but he certainly came up with the idea and he finally threw up his hands and said it had to have come here from outer space. <laughs> DNA. DNA could not have occurred naturally on Earth by looking at the, the natural process that are going on in Earth. So there was only one way it got here. 
and it got here from outer space. That's a real cop-out, isn't it? The question is, okay, where did it still come from? It doesn't explain where it came from. It just displaces it again, just like the RNA uh, argument. It just displaces it. And then you've got, again, I'd like I say, I don't want to feel like I'm picking on him, but since I, I've read his book and, and seen some of the silly stuff in it, Francis Collins, who was the head of the Human Genome Project, which we've looked at in depth here last week, uh, geneticist and, and MD, he said that it was either placed here by God in the world or God created it here. In other words, it wasn't undirected chemical processes. It was directed chemical process. Well, that at least throws away the chance hypothesis, doesn't it? That's not what the evidence is. And I'm just not sure why, well, I, we're going to look at why Collins holds to that. But at least it throws away the chance hypothesis, I guess, because God could have placed DNA here. He could have done that. He certainly, DNA's in us. We're, it's here. He did place it here, if you want to say that. He created animals. He created plants. He created them with DNA. But that's not what he means by that. He means DNA was placed here in its kind of, if you will, infancy. And from that molecule evolved all the rest of the animals. That's what he means by that. So he either placed it here or he created it here. So why would a real smart guy like Francis Collins, very intelligent guy, head of the Human Genome Project, hold to this idea? And he's, like I said last week, he's a Christian. He believes in the historiosity of Jesus Christ. He believes in the New Testament. believes the New Testament is accurate. He believes that miracles did occur. He doesn't dismiss that. But why does he still hold to the evolutionary processes that are going on? And the reason he does, and I think erroneously so, lies in the human genome. Okay, he's looked at the human genome. If anybody's looked at the human genome, it's Francis Collins, isn't it? And so he's looked at, at the human genome, and he thinks not just the human genome, but the genome of other animals uh, as well. And he's looked at the genome, and he's come up with that, after looking at that, that's still the only way that life could have occurred is through evolutionary processes, given the fact that DNA started it all. And uh, next week, we're going to look in depth at the human genome, look at the arguments that are made not only by Francis Collins, but others as to why, uh, in fact, when the human genome was discovered for the, for the, for the evolutionist, it then became a slam dunk. Okay, how can creationists argue against this? There is no argument for this. Well, I think you know that there is, or we wouldn't be having this class, but there are very good arguments against it. And when you see the arguments against it, they make a whole lot more sense than the, than the arguments for it. But we'll look at that in detail next week. <laughs>